if I did not have confidence in what I would be, at what I am doing, then you, that's, there's, there's a problem with this. There's a problem with this. If I don't believe that biblically what I'm doing is of God, then you shouldn't be sitting under me listening, and I should be hightailing it out of here, because one day I'm going to be accountable before God. But I fully believe that what I'm doing is biblical and that I have biblical text to support it. I fully believe or I would not be standing here. I fully believe that what God has called me to do is exactly what I'm doing and I'm not ashamed of it. There, 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Let a woman learn. Do you know what Paul first of all said here? Let a woman learn. Let a woman do what? Learn. Father, let every blinder be removed from this room and this house tonight. Lord, let every, every position, every doctrine, every belief that they may have had over the years, sitting under teaching that was full of unbelief, let it fall to the floor right now, full of unbelief, falls to the ground right now. Let them hear with the eyes of their spirit man and let them understand what the word of God is and the heart of God right now. Let them understand with learning. Let it add to their understanding right now. They're going to rise up in faith and see the the truth in Jesus name. So in verse 11, it says, let a, a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. First of all, you have to understand this passage was speaking to, Paul was speaking to a church in that day, in that hour, in that age, that women didn't learn because women were not learned. They ha were not educated. They did not have an opportunity to be educated and they were not in a position to teach at the time in that culture. Instead, they were plagued and, v and they had seen so much of idolatry and worship of, of goddesses. And, and this was what women knew of. Women were no more than property. They were no more than slave status to both their fathers and then their husbands for those that were married. So women at the time were not viewed as even equal to men. They weren't viewed, but the last time I read my Bible, we were all created in the image and in the likeness of who? Genesis 1.26. We were all created in the image and the likeness of God, right? So, but in the culture, women had not yet had the opportunity to learn. And so Paul says, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Yes, exactly. Because at the time, anything that would have come out of their mouth was not going to be truth. They had not learned yet. But I love that he said, let a woman learn. The heart of God is let a woman learn. Because you're not like, you're not the lesser version of mankind. Women in this room. And so when you look at the word silence, Strong's 22, 71, silence means quietness. It means stillness. It means peaceableness. It, it means not being contentious. It doesn't mean mute. It doesn't mean you will for ne forever not speak in any kind of a church setting. How can I say this so confidently? You'll see in a moment. And verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Not to usurp authority. Not to have authority over a man. Not to usurp authority. There's a big difference. You have to understand, not to have authority over a man is, means not to usurp authority. But if God has positioned that person in authority, then there is no usurping happening. So Paul is saying, do not assert yourself into a role of leadership when you have not been authorized to it. Not every female has been authorized into a position of teaching both men and women, but some have. How can I say this so confidently about this passage of Scripture? Because the Bible has to be backed up with the Bible. Because you have to look at the whole context. You have to look at the whole counsel of God, and it needs to actually back itself up, right? You can't just take one or two Scriptures and go, well, I'm going to make a doctrine out of this. Then I'm just going to make a doctrine out of this. So let's, let's look at the heart of God. We're going to look at one woman that's in the Old Testament, and we're going to look at three that are in the New Okay, so Deborah, Deborah was teaching and influencing both men and women. God appointed her to do so. Did he not? 
She wouldn't have had that position if God had not appointed her. She was teaching both men and women. She was authorized by God to do this. Deborah taught men. She was a prophetess, a judge. She was a co-leader in the military. And this was her church. This was her church. So whether I stand here and preach inside of this building to you, or whether we step outside into the parking lot and I preach to you, or whether we're someplace overseas on, you know, on, mission, on the mission field preaching to you, we are the church. God appointed her, and he was preaching to the real church, the body of Christ, the people. That's who she was preaching to. So you can't say, well, a woman can't. You know, she can, she can teach outside, but not in church. You can't argue and you cannot deny the fact that God gave her great influence. And she did teach both men and women. And this is in the Old Testament. This is in the Old Testament. You know, God's going to choose who he's going to choose. Every word of God is flawless. Flawless. No mistake. Make no mistake in it. Let's... Let's go on. Ephesians 4.11 says that he gave some, all caps. I want you to see it in your mind's eye. Some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. It does not say he only gave men to be in those roles. He gave some to be. Some people are okay with a woman as an evangelist, but God forbid she was behind a pulpit. It's ridiculous. There are five offices that are spoken, mentioned here. The fivefold ministry. How do you just exclude one? How do you exclude two? Is it, doesn't, even make, it doesn't even make any sense to say, well, you can be an evangelist even to men. What about the Samaritan woman? She was an evangelist. She was a preacher to the Gentiles. Come, see a man. He told me everything about me. Was that okay if she evangelized and she went and, and, and preached the word because it was outside? So, but if you come inside the doors, then something shifts? But there's no logic behind this at all. So, do you really think it is the heart of God to exclude women from roles that Jesus liberated them to walk in? Because Jesus liberated women. For many years, they were, you know, beat down and, and, and just beat into submission and all of that. We are to submit to one another. Because this discussion, this, this little teaching that I want to bring tonight, it, it's not a, a power struggle. And it's not women are better than men. We are equal. We all have been made in the image and in the likeness of God. And there should not be this level of you're here and this person's down here because we have the image and the likeness of our God created like that. And so the heart of God is to free, liberate, and Jesus did this, women, because there was a need to do so because men were already liberated. Men were already running. Men were already doing. Men were already called to these positions and knew that they were. So that's why the emphasis in this message right now is about women. I don't think I am any better than any of the men in this room. I just know that I'm called to the position that I'm standing in. And, and, I, and I'm not backing down from that position because I know God's called me to it. I know he's equipped me for it. I know, that what I've, I know what he's trained me up to do, and I don't take it lightly because it's a responsibility. The Bible says that if you're going to teach people, you need to be careful. Because you're going to be judged on what you teach even higher than them. Every word. It's really a serious calling. It's not something that you take lightly, and it's not something that you just flippantly do. But it isn't something you should also shy away from if God's called you to it, right? So our culture, although it is changing, and slowly it is, into the culture that we have today, where women are learned, where women are educated, where women did have the opportunity, just as men and still do, to learn what you need to do and listen to the call of God and run with what he's told you to run with, right? So the culture is changing. 
but you'll always have, and we still have, those, those few that just feel they've got to correct you and they've got to put you in, in what they think is your place. That's okay. We bless them. We love them. We don't get upset. But at the same time, we don't shrink back. But you use it as an opportunity to grow and to sharpen your sword. I, I'm not done here, but I just want to say I'm speaking this to you all because, because you guys come to a church where the woman is the lead pastor. And then on top of that, an apostle. Which is a lot, you know, you'll get a lot of opposition from people that just have such a religious spirit. They don't understand it. That's okay, because there was a time where we didn't understand it. But God has opened up our eyes. He's opened up our eyes and he's helped us to see and to understand. You know, in Ephesians 4.11, when he said God, he says he's given some to be, he didn't just say pastors. He didn't just say prophets and teachers and evangelists. He also said apostles. Why would God say, out of the five gifts that I say in the New Testament, I've given some to be? Why would Jesus, why would God say, I'm going to give four of those, but the one, the apostle, that one's out. That one's out. It's all in the list, and it's all in one sentence. It's not even, it's all one thought. So it's man, because they're not used to, because it hasn't been taught so much. It's starting to be taught now, the, the fivefold ministry, which includes an apostle. So now it's starting to be taught more. So people are starting to understand it. But you're still going to have those that don't because it's a religious mindset. It's the old mindset. But that doesn't mean that it's God. Okay, let me, let me, let me finish here. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And he has poured out his spirit on all flesh. That's Acts 2, 17. As God used Mary Magdalene as the first preacher to preach the gospel to men after the resurrection, he still uses women today to preach to both men and women inside and outside of the church. You can look that up, John 20. Um, Phoebe was a female deacon in the church. The word says in some versions, a servant. But when you look up the word servant, you'll see that it means a deacon. That's Romans 16, 1, by the way. She had influence over men and women in the church. Men learned from her as she was entrusted by God to lead in her role of leadership. So scripture authorized it. Uh, Priscilla and her husband taught Apollos. These women and many others, I mean, I just listed a few. Like I said, one in the old, three in, in the new. These women and others in the Bible are, t are used by God to teach and to lead men because God is always looking at the heart. So scripture does authorize both male and female to preach in the church, in the church building, and to even preach to men. Imagine that. Whoever he's called, he's appointed, right? So women are authorized to preach in the church to men, and there are many examples in the Bible, and I've only listed a few. But we, we do need to understand the audience to which is being spoken and the concept when we read in the Bible. We have to understand the concept and the audience of what, who's being spoken to and the why. Otherwise, and I'm going to end with this, otherwise men with long hair would be considered a disgrace. How come nobody ever says that? I mean, it's ridiculous for us to even mention it, right? But because of the argument, like if you're going to say, because you're a female, you shouldn't be doing the call of God. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be preaching to men. Okay, then. Then if we're going to go like that, then in 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen, you know, it says that men, it's a disgrace for men to have long hair. I mean, like even when we think about that, is that not a ridiculous statement? What matters, the external or the heart? Because God always looks at the heart, right? Women should not wear braided hair. Does anybody have braided hair tonight? And do you ever braid your hair? Um, you shouldn't have gold, and you certainly shouldn't have expensive clothing. Honestly, do you really think God cares if you shop at Walmart or if you go to Nordstrom? As long as you're listening, as long as you're doing the will of God, as long as you're not getting in debt, as long as there are some common, there are some common sense things. As long as you're, you're tithing, you're giving, you're living in balance, you can pay your bills, you're working, you know, all the things. But does God care about what God? No. 
But if we were to use this one, oh, women should not be teaching men, then we're going to have to go to all of these things. We're going to have to, let's just lay them all out. Let's just lay them all out. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Wait, did your hand cause you to sin? You better chop that hand off. Did your eye cause you to, you better gouge that eye out. But this is what the word in the New Testament. And so what do we do with that? Well, we realize, was was the Bible really talking about if you're sinning with your eye to gouge your eye out? Or was it really talking about, let's get your heart right? Because even if you were to gouge your eye out and you had a problem with, with some kind of pornography or something, do you really think you wouldn't use your other eye? And do you really think if they were both gouged out that you wouldn't use the imagination that God gave you? Gouging your eyes out is not going to help one thing. And that's not what Jesus meant. He's always looking at the heart. Because I'm sure there are some of you in this room that have the same question, may have had the same question, or other people have questioned you. Why would you come and sit under a woman? You've never had that question? Thank God! Praise the Lord! There are a few, but I know there are plenty that have had this opposition. God's called me to do it. And I'm not going to back, I'm not going to back down. I do it, I do it in the fear and the trembling and the awe of the Lord. I know my responsibility. I know what I say has great influence. Not because I'm a woman, but because God's called me to the position he's called me to. And I am accountable to God. And the men of this church that God's called you to be pastors, same thing. The women of this church that God's called to be pastors, same thing. We're called by God, but we do know that we are also responsible for what we say, when we teach, what we teach, and how we are influencing people.